any one of us in here really a hero? Is any one of us in here really qualified to be called the hero? No. That's why we're unlikely heroes. We shouldn't be heroes. You look through the book of Matthew there, and you look at the genealogy of Jesus, and the women that's in the genealogy, or the men also, but the women kind of stood out to me, the women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ was unlikely heroes. They should not have been in the line of Christ. If I was making a hero as, of Christ Jesus, I would not put those women in the line of Christ. And yet God does. God takes broken vessels. God takes those who, who seem to be unusable, who seem to be, uh, humanly speaking, we would set them on the shelf and set them aside. And yet God takes those broken vessels and uses them in the church. And this is something different. I was just thinking this weekend, you know, in, in uh, leadership in a business, you have to make sure that the business is moving forward. And if somebody is not helping the business move forward, they need to go. They need to, they're, they're done. But that's not the way it is in the church. We take those who seem to be not helping the business move forward and we spend time with them and we, we mature them, we strengthen them, we pour the love of God into them and we don't throw them away. We don't throw them aside, but we continue to reach out to those that are oppressed and reach out to those who are, are broken by all appearances are broken. And that's what the church does. Why? Because that's what God does. God takes the broken and makes something out of it. And so I asked this morning if, uh, if Drew would bring a, a bag of Legos. I knew he was a Lego, uh, a Lego guy, and uh, he brought me a bag of Legos. And uh, Michael, would you do me a favor? If you can grab that bag of Legos right there, I'd like you to build me the nicest, biggest uh, temple, palace, house, whatever. Build me a building out of those Legos right there while I'm preaching. I'll give you, I'll give you a, look at this, man. I am giving him a, an opportunity to play with Legos while I preach. This is, this is great. He's going to remember this Sunday. So you can take him back and sit by your wife so she can kind of help you and tell you. I know, you know she's going to want it done just right anyway. So. <laughs> well, a couple weeks ago, I, I spoke about Christ as the head. And Christ is the head of the church. Man, it is so exciting and actually kind of overwhelming to me to think that I am continuing the ministry of Jesus Christ. While Jesus was on earth, he did some phenomenal things. But when he left, he didn't take that ministry and says, all right, my ministry's done. No, he left us to carry on the work of Jesus Christ. Do you realize the responsibility we have this morning? We have a responsibility to carry on the ministry of Christ Jesus in the day in which we live. It's interesting, as, as Jesus left, you know, he spent three years working with, with his disciples and trying to, to really pour into them and to train them and to teach them as best that, that, that they could comprehend, they could understand. Did they get it all? No, they didn't. And he left them in charge. And it's interesting, though, you know, he, he poured his life into these, these guys, and then he left. But if you read the New Testament, there's really not a whole lot more about them in the New Testament. You start seeing other unlikely people coming up through the ranks. You start seeing the Apostle Paul, who endeavored and did his best to stomp out Christianity in the beginning, and his life was rearranged and changed on a road to Damascus. And we see throughout the New Testament how God used Paul and how God used Silas and how God used Timothy and how God used all these different people from different backgrounds and different walks of life. What was God doing? God was bringing that body and joining it together to impact the known world for Jesus Christ. That's what he was doing. And I believe that God is still about that same business today. God is still about bringing different people from different backgrounds and different paths, different lives, bringing them together and joining them together and encouraging and uplifting and edifying the body, but impacting the world for Christ. One of the core values that as the elders sat down here a little over a year ago and, and we come up with some core values, the direction we want CPC to go. One of those core values is we will worship together with people of different backgrounds, biblical backgrounds and persuasions. We will accept them. We will. We might not agree with everything they do, but hey, if it lines up with scripture, you know, that's, that's perfectly fine. Or if they see that in scripture, that's okay. We can worship 
together. That's why, uh, you know, Andy and I was talking, he's got, we're kind of a counterbalance to one another because I get excited pretty quickly and he's kind of reserved. And so we kind of maybe balance each other out to some extent because I can get excited. I can get worked up. I can get excited about serving God. And he has just a reserve. He's just a, a level, you know, doesn't get really worked up and excited. And that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Why? Because we are a body that worships and works together to strengthen, to encourage, to uplift one another as God working through us. But the main thing that I wanted to talk about last week was, or two weeks ago, was Christ is our head. So Christ is in charge. Christ is the head. Under Christ, the next thing we see is that in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 is where we are this morning. It says this. It says, and everyone present, excuse me, I am an ax. <laughs> Peter, Peter chapter, that's, that's a good one too. I'll get to that one later. Um, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. It says, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into, a, into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. The body is his holy priests. You know, a lot of times we actually in our, in our setting, we have kind of gotten away from the word priest and we would use more of a, a minister or a preacher for some of that role. But in reality, we are all called to be ministers. That's what we're all called to do. But if you take this back to the, uh, the Old Testament, I don't want to get into a whole lot of background here, but we have to set some of this up. If you go back to, um, go back to Abraham, you go back to as, as far as Abraham and God, what did God do with Abraham? Who was Abraham? Was he a chosen? Was he a, a phenomenal guy? Was he a, a, a man of, of great character, a man of, of high esteem? He was a pagan. <laughs> he was a pagan. And God said, I want you to go to a land that I'll show you. And what did Abraham say? Well, I want you to map it all out. No, he just stepped out in faith. And what does scripture tell us? It was his faith that made him right with God. It was just simply his belief. Okay, God, that's what you want. That's what I'm doing. I'm willing. I'm going. And God called him out and his promise to him was to prosper him and give him great lands but also to give him a nation, to give him a family. And from that nation, he promised, from that nation, he would bless the whole world. Well, you can go forward from that, and you can go from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants, and we get down into to Egypt, and they're all in Egypt, and then comes along Moses, and Moses calls out, let my people go. That's what God says, and, and the end result is they get out, and they wander around in the wilderness. And they're in the wilderness, and God calls Moses up to, the, to Mount Sinai, and he begins to give him some regulations and some rules, and he meets with him. And some of that you can read in a book of Exodus chapter 20, or excuse me, 36 through 40. You can read the outline. The, the, this is the, the tent that I want you to build because I want to dwell among my people. I want to be a pre-Emmanuel. <laughs> we think of Emmanuel, as I mentioned earlier, we think of it as just Christmas. That's, that's Christ. No, God said, I want to be with my people. I want to dwell among my people. And it's interesting as you look in, in this, this, these chapters, chapter 36 through 40, you can see very detailed how Moses just laid out this tent so that God could dwell in the Holy of Holies. And you come down to the end of, of chapter 40, and it's actually the end of the book of Exodus. You come down to the end of chapter 40, and Moses is, is standing there, and so at last, the tent is done. And it says this in verse 33. So at last, Moses finished the work. Verse four, 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God dwelling with them. God in that, that holy of holies. God in that place. God among us. That Emmanuel. God is with us. Can you imagine the excitement of the people of Israel? This God that they had been told about that seemed so far away, that they had seen the cloud on the mountaintop and they had heard Moses talk to them about this God. Now this God is dwelling among us. 
Yes, we can't go into the Holy of Holies. We can't go in there, but he's here. He's among us. He's dwelling among us. And you can read through the scripture and you can see how the, the cloud settled on the tent and they stayed. And then when the cloud lifted, it would lead them in that, that leadership and that guidance of God. And they just followed him, led him around, and, and he was just with them. And we can go into a lot of this, but I just want to fast forward a ways and get to David and how David was, was building his own houses and building his own places, his own lands. And, and he's like, you know what? He said, this, this is great. Man, this is phenomenal. I've got these beautiful houses, but we haven't built a, a permanent dwelling for God. And God said, it's okay. I didn't ask for one. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't tell you to build me one. I'm perfectly fine being a mobile God. I'm perfectly fine in this dwelling. But he allowed him to or he agreed to have the temple built. Now, he didn't allow David to build it. Solomon had to build it, but David got everything ready. And Solomon went and he built this temple for God to dwell in. And here's what 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burnt up the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. So now we have this temple. We have this place where the presence of God dwells. The Holy of Holies is inside of that temple. And we'll, we'll talk about the Holy of Holies a little bit. I don't want to bore you. Man, this, it's, it's exciting to me. But the Holy of Holies is inside of this temple. Now there's duties. If you read through uh, the book of Exodus, and you can read down there towards the end of Exodus, you can see some of the duties in Leviticus. And there's a lot of different places where they have duties of the priests. So there was priests that had, a, had a, a purpose, had a service. They gave their life to service to God and to serve the people. Their purpose was to serve God in the tabernacle. And here's just a list, just real quick. I want to go through a list of what their responsibilities was. They were to teach the people. A responsibility of a priest was to teach the people, to show them the ways of God and to lead them and to guide them in the way that they should walk. They were also to serve as judges for controversy. If there was any controversy, if there was any problems, you was to go to the priests and they would serve as a judge and they would settle it and it would be taken care of. Their responsibility was to offer sacrifices that was brought to them. So the people would come, they would bring their sacrifices to the priests. The priests would offer that sacrifice as, an, as a covering or as an atonement. And we'll talk about that in a little bit also. They was to bless the people. They was to bless God. They was to keep the tabernacle in order, and they was to care for the altars, the lamp, and the showbread. This is the job of the priest. This is what they were supposed to do. But there was a high priest. The high priest was over the priests. He was kind of the top dog in the priests. <laughs> All right, he was he was he was the the, the number one guy, and his responsibility was to serve as a mediator between God and man. That was his responsibility. He would inquire of the Lord. We can see in Judges, he went and, and asked of God how, what they should do or for his leadership and guidance. He would direct the work of the priests and the Levites. He consecrated the priests. But on the Day of Atonement, only happened once a year, on the Day of Atonement, he would go into the Holy of Holies and make sacrifice for all the people. That was his job. That's what he was supposed to do. So what is atonement? You know, a lot of times I remember growing up, I heard the word atonement and it, it was meant at one meant, at one meant. I'm, I'm right with it. And that's, that's correct. That's true. But the root word of atonement is actually to cover up or to sweep under the rug, so to speak. So you would come with your sacrifice to the priests and you would give your sacrifice to the priests and they would sacrifice that animal was to cover up your sin. Scripture is very clear that the offering of goats and of, of, of uh, cows and these things, they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't wash away sin. They didn't cleanse sin. They covered it up. So it was a covering up. But it's interesting, the process that they went through was really the same thing we go through today. Whenever the people would come and they would bring their sacrifice to the priest, there's some things that they were doing. First of all, they were confessing that they were sinners. 
That sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> that sounds familiar. You think that the Old Testament is so different than the New Testament? It's not. It's a shadow of the New Testament. They were confessing that I am a sinner. I have done wrong. I have done evil in the sight of God. I have fallen short of the mark, and I, will, I, 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 just, I need his forgiveness. And so they brought that sacrifice and laid it before the, before the, the priests. They also declared that God was right he knew their wrong deeds. They deserve to be punished. But God is a gracious God. God is a loving God. God cares for his people. And so it was a show of faith, believing that God would send a Messiah. They believed that one day there was a Messiah that was going to come. And in that show of faith, I am bringing this animal as a sacrifice for my sins, for what I have done. They also declared that they could not save themselves. There's nothing in my own strength and my own power that I can do to save myself. I am completely and wholly relying on one day of Messiah coming. I'm completely relying on a blood that will be shed one day for my sins. But as right now, this is a covering for my sin. This is just covering up or sweeping under the rug and, and storing it up until the price is completely paid. They showed faith. They showed an act of belief that God would send a Messiah. It was kind of like, if you think about it in this way, it's kind of like a visa, all right? A very important sacrificial animal. It was like that visa that was paying forward, okay? It's not paid yet, but I still have the forgiveness. I still am, am, am made right. I'm still at one with God, but it's not paid yet, but it will be paid. And now we are looking back on a payment is kind of like a debit. Now, I don't have an acronym for debit. I'm sorry. You're going to have to forgive me. Visa, I, had, I don't have an acronym for debit. But it's kind of like a debit. The price has been paid. And so I'm looking back on him saying, Father, I'm sorry. I missed the mark. Please forgive me. All right. It's paid. It's paid. It's done. On a cross a couple thousand years ago, there was a sinless, spotless lamb who hung on that cross and paid for my at one with God. He made me righteous in the sight of God because of his sacrifice that he didn't have coming to him. So I am now made right with God because of that. So all it was was something happened on a cross a long time ago. They were looking forward to, we are looking back on, but really the faith is all the same. It's still coming. You know what? I am a sinner. I deserve punishment. You are a righteous God, and there is nothing that I can do to attain righteous stand, right standing with you. I can't do anything in my own strength. And so I'm relying completely on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and in faith believing that that is enough. I want to tell you something this morning. It's more than enough. It's more than enough to cover your sins. Praise God this morning. So the high priest would go in and he would make this atonement. It's interesting if you, you look at this high priest as he would go into the temple. You know the high priest was a sinner also? We think that he was a, a holy man who went into the house. No, he had to make sacrifice for his own sins before he could go in and make sacrifice for the sins of the people. So he would make sacrifice for his own sins. He would make sacrifice for his own family. And then he would take and he would go into the holy of holies. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, he would go into the Holy of Holies and lay the sins of the people before a God who is gracious, before a God who loved, before a God who extended forgiveness. This day was a day, of a holiest of days. It was a day where no one worked. It was a day where, where they all would fast and they would spend the day confessing their sins before God. The high priest, as I mentioned already, would offer his sacrifice before God for his sins and for the sins of his family. Then he would enter the Holy of Holies and he would offer this special sacrifice for the sins of the people, including the sins of all the priests that was there and himself, Lord here we are, relying completely and wholly on something that has not happened yet, but we believe in your promise. They were made right by faith. They were made right by faith. It wasn't the act that made them right. It was the faith. We are presenting this sacrifice in faith, believing that there is going to come a Messiah. 
It's interesting, something that I, I, have, to, I have to point out that happened as, as the high priest went in. He took the blood of, of bull with him and sprinkled it on the altar as a sign of the, the payment of sins. But he took two goats in with him. This is exciting. He took two goats in with him. One of those goats he would sacrifice for the sins of the people. The other goat he would lay his hands on and he would begin to confess the sins of the people on that goat. Then they would take that goat out and they would take it out into the wilderness and release it and let it, let it go. What it was symbolically showing was that their sin was atoned for. Their sin was forgiven by the death of the one goat and their sin was taken away from them by the, the other goat, the scapegoat is what they called it. Their sin was taken away from them by that goat. But I'm here to tell you something this morning, that the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive all sins and can take our sins and throw them in the sea of his forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against you ever again. Not held against you ever again. The symbol is amazing. The reality is phenomenal. The reality is so exciting that my sins will never be brought up against me again. God doesn't have amnesia. He chooses to forget. I will not hold those against you again. He casts them in the sea of his forgetfulness. Praise God. So what's this mean for us today? That was a long setup, I know, but boy, that's exciting to me. That was a long setup, but we're ready to go now. What's this mean for me today, Scott? Well, what this means for us today is the scripture tells us in, in Hebrews chapter 7 and, and chapter 9 that Jesus is our great high priest. That's exciting. Because if you begin to look at the high priest of the Old Testament, there was many, many things that restricted them that Jesus just broke all the restrictions. You can look at the, the priest throughout the years. A priest was appointed for his lifetime, but you know what? He was human. He died. When he died, they had to appoint a new priest. So there was many priests. But whenever Jesus came and he died on the cross, he was a permanent, eternal high priest. Jesus Christ has been the high priest ever since his death until this moment and will continue to be. He is our great high priest. I got, I'm excited. Man, you look, listen to this. All right. He's not just your high priest. Scott started speaking tongues there for a minute, wasn't I? <laughs> He's not just our high priest. He is a priest who knows what we go through. He's a priest who knows what we face, who is tempted in like ways as we were, and yet is able to take the blood to the mercy seat of the Father and sprinkle it on there. He is an eternal high priest. They sacrificed daily in the Old Testament. I mean, it, was, it had to be a horrific uh, experience, really. I mean, just imagine the the. the, the depths of your sin every time you'd go there and just see all the blood. I mean, it had to be a, a, a horrific event, but they sacrificed daily, but there was a sacrifice of our great high priest that was once and was for all. It only needed once. Why? Because it has the power. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the lamb. It only had to happen once, and it paid the price for our sins. The high priests of the Old Testament were sinful men, they were sinners who had to make payment for their own sins before they could even go in before God to make payment for your sins. But we serve a high priest this morning who is holy, innocent, and unstained, and yet became man like us, took our price, took our penalty on a cross so that he could be our great high priest this morning. The Old Testament uh, oh, high priest had to offer sacrifice for themselves, but our great high priest didn't offer a sacrifice for himself, but he came and gave of himself so that he could take our penalty, so that he could take our price and put it on himself. He didn't have it coming. He didn't have it coming. It wasn't standing against him. He was sinless. He had no reason to die. But God the Father saw in his great wisdom that a prisoner exchange needed to happen. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could walk away free. Death, where's your sting? It has no sting. Why? Because Jesus took the sting on a cross many years ago. This morning we serve a great high priest who does not enter a man-made temple. But as uh, Roman, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12 tells us, that he entered a greater, more perfect tent, an eternal tent. That is heaven. He entered heaven and, and sprinkled the blood for each and every one of us. He didn't enter with the blood of lambs and of goats, but he entered with his own blood. 
He stands on his own blood. It's interesting to me as you begin to look at the high priests of the Old Testament, they would enter with the, the blood of bulls and, and the blood of, of a goat. They would enter with that. We're relying on, on this for your, your forgiveness. We're relying on this for, for being made right with God. And Jesus goes, I got my own blood. I don't need anything else. <laughs> I got my own. I can just bring my own and I can just bring it before the Father and just, here's my blood. I died so that they may be set free. You go into the book of Revelation. I don't have this in notes. I just, you go to the book of Revelation and you talk about something to excite you. You start reading about the accuser of the brethren and how he's cast down. You know why he's called the accuser of the brethren? Because he's constantly reminding the Father of your sins. He's constantly reminding the Father of how you fall short. But you know what? Scripture also tells us that we have a great high priest who intercedes on our behalf. So the devil will say, Father, look, 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 look here, look, look. And Jesus goes, I paid for it. I paid for it. Remember the blood that I brought? I paid for it. They're free. They're free. They can, they, they can continue to walk with you. They can t- continue to live in your grace. Why? Because the price that Jesus paid with his own blood so we could be set completely and wholly free. So we have a great high priest who knows what we face. He knows our struggles and our trials and our temptations. And he calls us to be the priests. He doesn't call us to be the sinners or the Gentiles out there in the courtyard. He calls us to be the priest. You are the priests this morning. I am the priest this morning. Our priestly role, all Christians should live, first of all, we should live sacrificially for those that we serve. What's it look to be a priest? What's it look like? We should live a sacrificial life for those that we serve. We are people of the cross. The cross, an empty cross, might I add, an empty cross is our symbol. We don't serve a cross with Jesus still hanging on it. He's not still there. He, he come down off of there and he rose from the grave and he lives forevermore. But the cross is our symbol. Why? Because it's a symbol of sacrifice. The God of heaven humbled himself and came and died on a cross so that we might be free. As imitators of this crucified Lord, we should be reaching out through sacrificial acts of love to a world around about us that needs Jesus Christ. We should be sacrificial people. We do not make atonement for others, but through our lives, we point them to the lamb who did make atonement for them. The price has already been paid. All you have to do is accept that payment. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all you have to do. It's paid for you. And so while we don't make that atonement for them, we point them to the one who can. We point them to the one who has made that atonement. So not only should we live our lives as sacrificial to those around about us, we should be faithful to offer intercession on their behalf. You know the breastplate that the high priest wore? It had the 12 stones of of, of the tribes. Why, Why was that there? Because it would always be over his heart. It was always on his heart, remembering the tribes. As he come before God, he was remembering all the tribes of Israel. When we come before God, if we are going to be the priests that God wants us to be, we should be interceding on the behalf of those in the body and those outside of the body. I think Andy, I think it was in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was in Romans, our Romans study in in, in men's group, uh, where Paul says something to the effect of, I I continually pray for all people all time, that that burden, that care that's upon his heart at all times, just remembering, God, be with them today. Strengthen them and encourage them and uplift them. And you know the battles they might be going through, but just that praying and the interceding for them on, on, at all times, we can see through Scripture that, that Paul lived the part of being the nation of priests. He encouraged Timothy in, in 1 Timothy. He says that you are to, uh, to offer supplications, prayers, and intercession, thanksgivings for all people, for kings, and for everybody who's in high positions. Offer these supplications, these prayers for everybody, not just those that are close, not just those that are part of your local body, but we are to pray for those outside of the body. We are to pray for those in leadership. We are to pray for, for all people that we can think of. God, just help me to, to pray for. When was the last time you prayed for the president? 
When was the last time you prayed for your con? I'm speaking to myself, all right? When was the last time I prayed for my congressmen or congresswomen? And I don't even know them to be real with you, but you know, when was the last time I, I prayed for just, I, I get so focused on my needs and the needs of those that I love that God help me to expand that and really carry a burden to intercede for those that are around about us. How long has it been since we just prayed for our neighbors? Maybe even the ones that don't like us, don't think too much of us. They've uh, uh, been very clear about they don't really care for you. When was the last time we prayed for them and loved them and cared for them? Lord, help each and every one of us. As a nation of priests, not only are we to live sacrificially for the world around about us, we are to offer intercession for them, but as a nation of priests, we have direct access to God this morning. If you go back and you begin to study the temple and you see that there was a curtain that was hung that was blocking the, the Holy of Holies, nobody, you couldn't go in there. You, you can't, it's, it's sealed off. That's where God is. You stay out. I get excited about this every time I talk about it too. Jesus was on the cross and just a few words, he said, it's finished. And there was a, a ripping of, of that, that curtain right down the middle from the top to the bottom. What was that saying? Come on in, come on in. The price has been paid in full. We can come boldly before the throne of God. We have that privilege to come boldly. Why? Because there was a price that was paid so I can come boldly before the throne of God. We have direct access. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12 tells us that it's because of Christ we now can walk in boldly and confidently into the throne room of God. I can start talking and I'll be in the throne room. You can start talking and you'll be in the throne room of God. Just there and talking with him and visiting. We have direct access to God. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that great? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19 says that we can enter boldly into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. It's not because I'm righteous in myself. It's not because I have done great deeds or great works, but it's because of what he has done. It's because of what Jesus has done. Because of that blood, I now can enter the holy of holies. Praise God. Spiritual sacrifices. We have a spiritual sacrifice that we can give. We still offer sacrifices, but they're not bulls. They're not lambs. They're not goats, but they are sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of prayer, sacrifices of thanksgiving, sacrifices of repentance, sacrifices of kindness, sacrifices of love. Boy, these are things that never was talked about growing up, wasn't it, guys? <laughs> it was all rules and regulations. Most of us here grew up legalistic, for those of you who don't know. It was all rules and regulations, and we didn't talk about these sacrifices. These are the sacrifices that we as a nation of priests live out on a daily basis. We live out the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We live out the sacrifice of praise. We live out this sacrifice of love and kindness to those around about us. This should be the sacrifices that we offer, that we live out. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 has already mentioned that we, uh, we offer these sacrifices or these spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. It's through his power. It's through his blood that we can offer these. I'm not a kind person left to myself. I'm pretty selfish and arrogant, to be honest with you. But whenever Jesus comes in, whenever Jesus fills, then I can live these out. Why? Because I sacrifice myself. Paul talks about that living sacrifice. I am a living sacrifice. My heart's still beating. I'm still breathing, but I sacrifice myself. I'm dead to myself. I am now living to God. He says there in, in the scriptures, he says, for me to live is Christ. I'm going to show Christ. Every day that I live, I'm going to show Christ. If I die, that's my gain. I'm looking forward to that. One of these days, I'm going to be in heaven. But until then, I'm going to show Christ every day. Let's make that our challenge, our goal in our life. Lord, help me to show Christ every day that I live. Help me to be that priest that you have called me to be. But we also have a, a prophetic role. As royal priesthood, we have a responsibility to declare the wonderful deeds that he has called us out of darkness and into light. We have that responsibility to tell a world around us that Jesus saves. You know, so many times, I'm not discrediting the word of God. I believe that it's, it's very, very vital. But it's interesting that early New Testament Christians didn't have this. They just went about telling what God had done in their life. And man, it spread like fire. And we begin to argue and we begin to say, well, I can't really witness because I don't know the scripture real well. That's okay. Just tell what Jesus has done in your life. 
There is no greater witness than a life that has been completely changed by the name of Jesus Christ. No greater witness than a life that was walking for itself. And whenever the world sees a life that's rearranged by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no greater witness. We've been talking in the, as, as elders, you know, how the church has an impact on the epidemic, the drug epidemic in, in the area that we live in. We should have an impact in that. What's that look like? And we've been praying, God help each and every one of us, lead us and guide us so that we can impact that. Because I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ can set them completely and wholly free. I believe that this morning. And there is no greater testimony than a life that is set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. So whenever you're going out and whenever you're talking to people, we have a prophetic responsibility. And that is just to tell them, this is what Jesus has done for me. I once was a sinner, but now I am saved. I once was an outcast, but now I'm a child of the king. He adopted me as his own. Praise his holy name. We are also agents of reconciliation. God is working in hearts. Andy mentioned in his prayer this morning, God, you know every refrigerator that has the family fun day hanging on it. Work in that heart. Work in that heart. God is working in hearts. And I believe that God can bring them to reconciliation. But for some reason, he chooses to use us. <laughs> for some reason, he goes, you're it. You're it. You are the mouthpiece that God uses to speak into lives where you live. Lord, help me. Help me to be that one that would speak into the lives of those around and about me and to show them Jesus Christ. So we've looked at this morning, we've looked at the high priest. I kind of went in reverse. I went temple priest, high priest. Then I went high priest, priest. I'm getting back to the temple, all right? Let's get back to the temple. It's interesting. If you begin to read in scripture, Jesus is building a temple. He's building a temple. And you might argue with me this morning and say, Scott, I am the temple. Yeah, I understand that. I, I get that. But there is so many places in Scripture where it uses you as a plural. We are the temple. When we come together, we're the temple. And you can read this in Scripture. In, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, it says, You are members, plural, of God's house. We are members of his house. Together, we are his house built on a foundation of apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Amen. The cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. The foundation is the apostles and the prophets. And here we are all brought together, joined together to make up this building. <laughs> That's exciting. It's exciting. I was thinking about this and I, I grabbed one of Drew's Legos. And you know, I got one Lego. Anybody will tell you a Lego is not going to do a whole bunch, all right? It's going to kill your foot if you step on it on the way to the bathroom at 12 o'clock, all right? It will do that. But, you know, it's really not going it, to, it's really pretty, pretty useless. But you know what? I was this Lego. I was. I, I'll admit to you this morning. I actually uh, was, as I mentioned before, I, I looked for the most legalistic group I could join and tried to join up with them. Um, I'm just going to tell you how legalistic they were. Um, one of the arguments they had at one of their conferences, whether they should go to Walmart or not, because when they walk in Walmart, they're on a screen, on a security screen, and they were so against television, they thought that was probably sin. They shouldn't do that. That's how legalistic they were, okay? I'm just setting the bar way out there. Adam, knock it off. <laughs> He's got that look. I've, I've worked with him too long. He's got that look like, what? <laughs> they set the bar way high, and I was like, I'm in. I'm in. That, that seemed a little crazy, but some of the other things, you know, I'm in. I was, I was that person. I thought my edges were, my edges were pretty straight, pretty square. Actually, my, my round thingies here on top, they're actually rounder than most people's. And, and I really, I was pretty perfect. I was pretty perfect, but I was useless. I was by myself. And you start reading scripture and you start reading where, kind of, your, kind of your temple there. All right, you guys ready for the, the great reveal? Wow, look at that temple. <laughs> who's number 24? Anybody know? I'm not in a NASCAR, but I don't know who number 24 
Jeff Gordon? Is it Jeff Gordon? All right, Jeff Gordon's temple here. And, uh, <laughs> but it's interesting, this is actually kind of cool. You know, this, this, this is what God is, is intending to build. This is what he's intending to build. And I, and I thought, you know, I, I really like, I don't know, I, I like a place of prominence. I think I'll, I'll go out front there. There. I like that place of prominence. So I'm, I'm important now. I'm, I'm a hero. I am somebody. But when you begin to read this scripture and you see we are members of God's family, the foundation of God's family is the apostles and the prophets. That's the foundation. We're actually building a building on the foundation of, of the prophets and the apostles? That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And then the, the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. He's the cornerstone. Now, this is, this is really, really cool. And you know, when we begin to humble ourselves, we'll be like, you know what? I don't know. I'm, oh, I'm breaking up. <laughs> I just went flying. I'm no longer part of the temple anymore. <laughs> but when we begin to humble ourselves, we could be like, you know what? I'm actually good just being a bush just out here on the side. I'm okay with that. Why? Because I'm a part of it. I don't have to have that place of, of, of importance. I don't have to have that place of, of leadership. I don't have to be somebody. I just want to be part of it. I just want to be part of that and see God work and see God move. It's interesting, you know, as we're, we're fit together as this body and when we all can humble ourselves and just, just work together and just be part of something amazing, something really, really cool, when we can just be, be part of that, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 says, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. We are called to be his holy priests. Through meditation of Jesus Christ, you are to offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. <laughs> we have this building that God is building, and we get to be a part of it. Unlikely heroes, man, this building is built by, of unlikely heroes. People who should not even been in this building are in this building today. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only reason. That's the only reason. But you know what? We have this temple. And that sounds great. But listen to this. On the day of Pentecost... All the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roar of a mighty windstorm that filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament's not irrelevant. The Old Testament is a shadow of what was to come. God is still filling his temple today. Whenever we come to Jesus Christ, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's by his power, it's by his working in my life that I change. It's by him working in my heart that rearranges me and, and changes my direction and just completely wrecks the old me. Thank God for it and makes a brand new me. I am a new creation today because of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something, guys. As a body, he's filling this temple. He's filling this temple. And we go out of here and we do great and mighty things to impact our world for Christ's sake. It's not because of me. Because I'm built on a foundation of apostles and prophets and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. And I've got brothers and sisters that I don't even know about. They're all around the world. They look different than me, different colors and different shapes and different sizes. And some of them are just, just, just all kinds of different. But we all work together 
for what? To build up the kingdom of God. And when Jesus Christ is our cornerstone and the Holy Spirit has filled us, the gates of hell cannot stand against us. This church will, I don't mean this church, I mean the church will march forward. Why? Because greater is he who is with us than he who is in the world. I think this morning of the scripture, Lord, open our eyes that we may see. God is for us. God is us with us. We are called to be priests. Don't leave it up to somebody who gets paid to stand behind a pulpit somewhere. Don't leave it up to them. Take responsibility yourself. It's your responsibility to be a priest to a world who needs to know God. Go out and shake the world for Jesus Christ. Now, I wasn't planning on this this morning, but it just happened to come to me. You know what? We have a great opportunity to do this this week but we have an organized opportunity to do it this weekend. Saturday is coming, and it's an opportunity to where you can just show God's love to a world around. You know what? You can be making cotton candy and witness to somebody. You can just love them. Maybe they'll just start opening up to you and start talking to you and telling you some of their problems and struggles, and you can just be a shoulder to step aside and, and just love on them. God has doors open for you. Let's walk. So this morning what I'd like to do is I would like for us to all come around the front. We're a family, so we can all come around the front. And I am going to ask Andy if you would lead us in prayer for Family Fun Day specifically. When we are done with that, I would like Jason and Lisa, if they would sit in the middle, and Mark, would you lead us in prayer for Grant and ask God to work in a mighty way in in this young man's life. So let's gather around the front, guys. Come on in, and let's gather around the front. Let's pray together. Amen.